land of ours and fill sportsman dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing pole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. Hi there. Come on in. It is Thursday night, April 26th, the year 2001. Oh, let me tell you, this month coming up, May is my most jammed May ever. I have trips I'm going on with my dad. I have uh, loads of legal things in court. You know, DNR cases, kind of a new thing for me, but it's, it's fun to actually do something about these injustices rather than just talk about them. Well, on this show, because the several of the public TV stations are running their auction this week, I'm going to save the real hot outdoor news for next week. We're going to look at a number of features of things that are happening at this time of year in the outdoors in Michigan. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. Uh, is that a little coho or? Yep, Jack. Coho Jack. How about that? This should be the weekend for smelt to run in Michigan. Generally, the last weekend in April is the peak of the smelt runs. Most people dip smelt with hand nets like this. Uh, this is a wire mesh one, very popular. Uh, we have some old nets in the museum here, like this one, all rusted and has the fabric type of <laughs> netting that, of course, it rots in time. But these aren't the only things you can use to dip smelt. There are other forms of nets, and one of them is the seine net. It's a net that might stretch 30 feet or so long, and fishermen walk through the water and round up the smelt with that. Now, that is not legal to use in Michigan for anything other than minnows for bait, not legal for smelt or anything else. But across the way there in Canada, using seine nets for smelt is legal. And where was this popular? Where could you find this? Well, it used to be checking out this old 1981 Lansing State Journal of the Smelt Dipping Hotspots. It showed down here Canada being the number one. They were talking about Point Pelee. Point Pelee was famous. I mean, they would close the parking lots when they got full, and people would dip smelt just to their heart's content. Well, Point Pelee now closes at 9.30 p.m. Nobody dips smelt there. There are hardly any smelt running in that area. But back in 1993, before they closed, John Ford and I went down there with the camera, and I think it's interesting to take a look at smelt dipping, the last hurrah at Point Pelee. Well, there's first ice, there's last ice, there's first smelt, last smelt. Or no smelt. Or no smelt. <laughs> What's the deal, Randy? I don't know. They're not here yet. Maybe we're just early yet. Okay. Well, show me your setup here. You're, uh, you've got some lanterns on posts. This is quite a, quite a rig, which all just kind of homemade stuff. Uh, you got oh. shovels. Look at this. We got shovels over here, and you've dug a trench. We dig a trench. We lay plastic in it, and what we do, we make a pass with the net, and when you pull it up. You dump your smelt, gravel, everything in the trench, and then my son goes through with a smaller net and dips the smelt out of the trench. That way you don't carry home tons of gravel. Now, is that how everybody does it? I mean, no. seining is not something that, you know, you do in the no, States. No, it's not. Uh, there's a variety of different ways. A lot of them don't bother at all with the gravel. They put everything in the cooler and sort it out at home. Ah. But we don't care to take all the gravel home with us. I'll be darned. Where, where did you learn this? Ah, a friend of mine, Chip Delu, is the one that showed, broke me in on it. And mm -hmm. We've been doing it for probably close to 10 years I've been coming up here every year. Okay, now you find the smelt run earlier at Peely here than... A little bit, usually earlier here at Peely mm -hmm. than they do at Tawas. When you go through and you scoop up, can you tell if you have smelt or not? Or you, usually, or you dump it anyway? No, you, usually you can tell because when you're pulling it up, when they start getting congregated up closer to the shore, they start jumping a little mm -hmm. bit. And and sometimes when there's a lot of them, you have them go over the net, too. Mm -hmm. We've had times 
not in the last couple of years, but we've had times where you had to get a third person out to help pull the net up mm. when you had a... But you'll go up and just say you don't have any in the net. You'll still go up and dump in the trench? No, no. Nope. If there's if there's no smelt, we'd leave the gravel out on the oh, beach, okay. dump it over, and then go back and make another pass. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're allowed to have up to a 30-foot net here. Ours is a 25. On this side of the point, the water drops off fast enough that a longer net doesn't gain mm -hmm. you anything because... You can't get out far enough without going over your waders mm -hmm. anyway. Randy Isles from Pittsburgh is the guy who invited me to this Peely Island of Smelt Fest. His buddy Brian Way works the other end of the net. Son Stephen scoops the smelt out of the makeshift trough. But there are other ways of seining smelt, too. Now well, we got some people here who have got some smelt. At least they're in the bucket right now. Now, you guys have different uh, technique. Oh, sure, we... We're lazy fishermen, you know. <laughs> we uh, we get them though. Now is that your uh, wife? That's the, that's that's the wife. She's the boss. The boss. Okay. Yeah. And she never wants to go fishing. But I I just keep talking to her, and after uh, after two or three days, then she settles down and she's willing to go. You see. So yeah. this you have a pole. How long is this pole? Oh, I don't know. Forty feet. Forty feet. Yeah. And you use that to put the right seine out, out into the water. I'll be darned. Right out there in that clear Lake Erie, uh, what do you call them, zebra mussels, got the lake all clean, nice and nice and uh, clean, clear, all that kind of stuff. Look at that. Doesn't okay. that look nice? Look at that. Okay, that's out there. And then you pull the pole out. Like that, and it settles down, see? Bring the pole back. There you go. Let me tangle that there. Andy Gugaber and his wife Rita are 70 years old. They've been seining smelt for 30 years and having fun. Do you leave it there a while? or do Well, you, you get more if you do, yeah. If, if, uh, let me have a hold of the string there. Now, see, we'll just make a little bowl, you see, out there, and the fish will come right in, you see. Okay. Yeah. We'll make a little bowl, but now this obviously takes some experience. Yeah, it does. It does. Am I trying to light out there? Yeah, he'll get out there and stand out there, John. You see, he's yeah, okay. a little bowl in that out there, just like that. See, fish will swim in there, and mm -hmm. we'll get about a half a dozen. You think you'll get a half dozen on this one? Okay. Are there weights on the bottom of oh, yeah, the we've got net? weights on the bottom. Okay, mm -hmm. and floats on the top. See, you get it so that the, the bottom is a little bit on an angle like this, see? Oh, that's not. This is like the best haul yet. Oh, it's a small one. Point Peely smelt used to be big, but not so much anymore. Now, you don't want to keep these little ones, do you? Uh, tiny ones. Send them back. I'm going to keep these three bigger ones. Talk about a practical net. This is it. So this is just, you say, like trellis yeah. material? Yeah. Did you buy it at a garden, oh, yeah. gardening you store? A, a huge. This comes in a strip 20 feet wide mm -hmm. and any length you want. And mm -hmm. so I just cut it right through the sand, you see? And uh, that's all there is to it. Huh. Finally, a decent haul yeah. of smelt. Oh, oh, there we go. Look at this. Here we go. Run is on. Run is on. Smelt season is closed now on Point Pelee. It closed last Saturday night, but Michigan has its best smelting ahead, maybe this weekend. Thanks to Randy Isles and Andy Gugaber, we got a look at smelt dipping Canadian style. It's different, but to me, it looks like a lot of fun. The smelt just aren't running down at Point Pelee, anything like they used to. The park closes early each evening, nobody dips. The moral of the story, fish and wildlife populations change constantly. Their patterns change. Nothing in nature stays the same, so take advantage of them while they're there. Now, another thing that's changed a lot in recent years is sturgeon in the Great Lakes. Used to be you could catch and keep sturgeon uh, fairly liberal seasons like uh, pike and muskie and walleye, but in recent years that's gone to mainly catch and release. So you won't find a sturgeon story like we found from the Detroit River back in 1993. 
sun up, the Detroit River, Trenton Channel, lots of boats walleye fishing. Frank at the Trenton Lighthouse told me about a fellow who caught a big fish the day before. Go ahead, Don, pick up this fish that nobody can see right now how big it is. Well, I'll try. This is a big one. This is Don Vigier hoisting his catch of yesterday down in the Detroit River. Look at the size of that. Jeez, oh, Pete, you were walleye fishing, eh? Walleye fishing with a jig. Light line, eight-pound test. What, was this the jig that caught it? That's the jig. Right there. That's the one with a minnow. So, and I yeah. uh, thought I had a snag. Now, did this <laughs> fish actually take the minnow in the jig? I oh, mean, yeah. So you caught it in the mouth. Oh, yeah. We're talking line here that's eight-pound test line, I mean light line. You had to think you were snagged. Oh, definitely. thought it was a snag. I even tried to break my line, and then it started to move. Hmm. <laughs> the snag was going upriver. No kidding. I'm going to have to put this thing down. Are you? <laughs> oh, okay, how much does it weigh? 65 pounds. 65-pound sturgeon. inches long. And slimy. And slimy, 60 inches. Well, we'll just set the rod right in front of it here, but let's take a look at this. People haven't seen a sturgeon, a prehistoric type of fish. It does not have scales. No scales, no bones. No, it just has cartilage inside, and the skin is very strange. Correct. And we look at the mouth of it, how it feeds. That mouth actually uh, sort of goes down like a vacuum cleaner as it picks up things off the bottom. Right. And they don't normally, you know, go for... No, <laughs> never saw one before, Never, never, de definitely never caught one. These little barbels that, that they have on the front are feelers, which uh, sort of search for the food and right. because its right. eyes aren't very significant. And, and it's so dark down there. Yeah, let's flip it down. Yeah, it's not actually the most attractive fish going, but it's definitely the, the largest sturgeon or the largest type of fish we have in the Great Lakes in this whole area. You know what the state record is? No, I don't. About 192 pounds, oh, I think. Oh, is that right? Wow. But not very many people catch these on hook and line. Never. What, what was What was the battle story? You were here holding this rod and reel. Oh, yeah. Thought I had a snag, and then it started to move, so we moved with it. And an hour and a half later, we got a look at it. An hour <laughs> and a half? hour and a half, and the net definitely wasn't big enough, so my friend had to grab it. He got a hold of it. I dropped the rod. That's you? Right. Dennis Rodriguez. Come in here, Dennis. Come on, Dan, the net man. The net man who turned into the, the fish handler. To the grab, to the gap. So yeah. so you had it up alongside the boat. Right. right. And, and it was tired? I was tired. <laughs> I knew you were. Come on in here. How, how did you grab it? He had the, the rod bent over. How well, did you, where first, did you? Well, first he had the head up, and I could, I was going to try to grab that, but uh, it was just too big. So then I put on some gloves, and then I put on a life jacket, because I didn't want it to pull me in. Mm-hmm. I said, Don, go up towards the front to try to get the tail to come up. And when he did, I reached out and just grabbed a hold of the tail. Oh, the tail. Right. right. So it has this. See if you can pick it up by the tail there. A lot of fish, well, the tail collapses. No, I just had it like this here. Okay. And then uh, he says, okay, when you're ready, let me know, and I'll throw the rod down and we'll grab it. So I managed to get the tail up to the back of the boat like this. I said, okay, let's try it. And then you threw the rod down. How, and how did you grab it? I just grabbed it around the body. I mean, while you're hanging halfway out of the boat? Right, right. And we flipped it into the boat and said, wow. Wow. Yeah, I bet you said wow. <laughs> and, and, and what did the sturgeon do after battling for an hour and a half? Or two I hours? didn't do a lot. It, didn't, it, it would come it? up, it would come up, and then it would just drop down. The hardest thing was pulling it off the bottom with this small line and mm -hmm. small rod. It was just, uh, I thought for sure something was going to break, you know, at the last minute. And okay. Didn't. With the wind blowing, you could just hear the line singing. I mean, it was just howling. It was unbelievable. Now, when did you know... Uh, you had to figure it had to be a sturgeon uh, yeah. or a snapping turtle or something? Well, I figured it had to have been a sturgeon. You know, after a half hour, I said, mm -hmm. it's got to be a sturgeon. It's not a salmon. It's not a steelhead. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was well over an hour before we saw anything. That's a lot of patience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that really is. A tendency of a lot of anglers, and I've done it myself many times, after five or Just ten minutes, horsing. you start horsing and break them off. Right, right. Well, did we, you start working it more gingerly? Yeah. When you saw it? Yeah. Definitely. When it would, it started to run. It ran them four or five times, and I loosened up on him. But we got him in the boat, and I went for the jig, and I mean, the jig fell out of his mouth. Oh, no kidding! Fell out of his mouth. Wow. I said, well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, here we have Don Vigier, his 65-pound, 60-inch, right, Great Lake sturgeon, Dennis, Dennis Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yes. The, the handler, he's the tail man. Anybody needs a good tail man on a big sturgeon? We've got it Anybody right here. we got a big net for sale? <laughs> yeah, a big net. That's great. Well, congratulations. Thanks, man. Great to see a fish like this.
We opened this show with Michigan's smallest game fish, the smelt, and then we looked at the largest game fish, the sturgeon. Now let's take a look at a medium-sized fish that is quite available right now around the Great Lakes ports, those little jack salmon. As the sun was trying to break through the clouds, John Ford and I were on the bay off Marquette. Gary Schneider has fished these waters for many years. On this cold April day, an iron ore freighter was pulling in to load up with ore pellets destined for Ohio waters. That was just about the extent of the boat traffic. The weather last week hit a cold snap, which never seems to really stimulate good fishing. That's why only a couple of other boats were around that morning. Fairly standard rig here. This is a pinky jig with a whole night crawler attached, tied right on directly to the line. This is eight pound test line. Uh, long spinning rod. So we're just spinning here, dropping it down, jigging off of what they call the bubbler here at, off of Marquette. This is a hot water discharge that comes off of the power plant. Now, Gary Schneider, you go on duty at what, noon? Noon. Noon. So. Local city cop up here, right? Yeah, right. Well, let's get our limit. <laughs> oh, our <laughs> limit. Are we going to get our limit or our fill? Well, you can get your fill, <laughs> as long as we don't get rained on. Yeah, it's a, it's a chilly morning. As This is what happens in the spring when you go out fishing. A lot of people ask me, were you out on the opener? You getting out there early? Man, we got a north wind here. We're all dressed in our long underwear. Faye Williams. You better believe it. I got my long underwear on. <laughs> it's cold. It is. There's only one other boat cruising around here. We'll probably see him going by with his electric motor, and he hasn't gotten anything. But off this bubbler here where the warm water comes, the fish concentrate? Yeah, they, they concentrate real heavy out here, but it's usually better uh, a few weeks earlier than this. Earlier? Yeah. Right? If you can get out here in February and March, that's the best time usually for jack salmon fishing out here. So the water is open? Right oh, yeah. The well, in normal, most years, yes, but there is times when it does ice over out here. And then the guys come out and stand on the edge of the ice and fish in with the bubbler. Huh. Well, we're here just drifting and jigging with a crawler and a jig. And that's normally the way we do it out here. And then what's the alternative? Say we uh, fiddle around here for a half hour, hour, and don't do any good? Oh, we either go for coffee or we start trolling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll start trolling and see what happens. Well, we continued jigging, watched another boat or two trolling. This guy with an electric motor, well, he wasn't landing any. After we moved to a new spot, I got a hit. Hey! We have something. We are not skunked. Oh, yeah. Well, where'd we go? Ah, he's right down here. A lively little critter. What do we have? Yeah, look at that. Now, is that a little coho or? Yep, that's Jack. Coho Jack. How about that? Well, I'm very pleased. Now, there's a lot of people who would say, that fish is too small, throw it back. I would say, the size of my grill is perfect. <laughs> I agree. Huh? No, seriously. I mean, these are... Uh, that's the best eating size. That's right the there. best eating size right there. These are running about 12 to 14. That is, that is great. Gary, we didn't <laughs> get skunked. <laughs> Jake, my hand. It's cold. This, this man took us. You see, we were at that other bubbler and weren't marking any fish. And you said your instincts, your, your many years of being a youper <laughs> and fisherman. Of course, uh, Faye was just back here telling more stories. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm good at stories. I'm, I'm going to put on another worm. We put that on the worm and the jig hook up. Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm warmer already. Well, actually, I wasn't too warm with this north wind. The fish I caught was a small coho jack, a, a young one. You can tell coho apart from small king salmon. Coho shed their scales very easily. That's characteristic of coho salmon. Well, this is fun. And we thought that maybe we were going to get skunked. I really thought we were going to get skunked, to be honest with you. I mean, there's uh, two boats out here. It's very cold. Listen to that. I, I don't know if you can hear that, John, the, the fish finder going off. That means that they're a little bit away from the discharge on the bottom. We're getting away from the discharge and they're out here? Yeah. The discharge right over there. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can see that water is... Uh, how much warmer is that discharge, Faye? By the time it gets out here, only about 10 degrees warmer in the lake. But that's enough difference for the fish. Yeah. 
Faye Williams is a contractor who has a little spare time on his hands in the UP. He usually spends it hunting and fishing. Near us, a couple was catching a fair number of was herring, or maybe they were Menominee or whitefish. We couldn't tell from a distance. But we were after the tasty coho, or maybe even a 10-pound king. Gary Schneider got the next hit, also drifting a jig with a night crawler. You got the net thing? Yeah, I got it right here. Well, grab it. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I thought I missed you wanted it. Bring it right over to the side if you can. You know, it's amazing with the cold water how much it's fighting. This is just trying to get warm, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gary, I think mine was a little bigger than yours. I think yours is just a little bit smaller. <laughs> no, oh no, I think mine was about a half inch bigger. <laughs> well, you wouldn't call this a banner day of spring salmon fishing, but we did catch a couple jack coho. And at times, they tell me around this hot water discharge, the fishing can also be very hot, too. Even the small coho fight well. They're silvery and come from cold water. Top quality. Now, the fillets from these Lake Superior coho jacks look as pretty as fillets come. Deep red, no fat. I broiled a couple of these, which were terrific. But my favorite was putting them in the microwave for three minutes with a little lemon juice, a little white wine, and seasoning salt. Wow, I don't see how they could be cookbook for Clarence Canopy's recipe called Barbecue Fillets. Now, this will work with most any fish, trout, panfish, walleye, bass. But the fillets should be skinned, pat them dry, and put them on aluminum foil. Sprinkle lightly with oh, onion, garlic, salt, or your own favorite spices. Then top with slices of lemon and slices of onion. Pour barbecue sauce over the top. Cover with another piece of foil, or if you used a large one to begin with, fold it up so it's tight. You can bake this on an outdoor grill for 15 minutes or cook it in a wood fire or in the oven at 350. The lemon and onion and barbecue sauce will add a pleasing flavor to any fish fillet. It's called barbecue fillets. Easy to make. Give it a try sometime this summer. I know you'll enjoy it. You had to think you were snagged. Oh, definitely. Thought it was a snag. I even tried to break my line. And then it started to move. Hmm. <laughs> the snag was going upriver. No kidding. I'm going to have to put this thing down. Are you? <laughs> oh, okay. How much does it weigh? 65 pounds. 65 pound 60 sturgeon. Inches long. And slimy. And slimy. 60 inches. Well, we'll just set the rod right in front of it here. But let's take a look at this. People haven't seen a sturgeon, a prehistoric type of fish. It does not have scales. No scales. No bones. No, it just has cartilage inside. Hi, I'm Fred Trost. You know, you may have heard that wild turkeys are really smart. Well, if they're so smart, how is it the hunters can use fake plastic and foam turkey decoys to entice the real thing. I'll show you a whole series of situations where real turkeys encountered the phony ones. See it all on the Practical Sportsman, same time, same station, right here on Public TV.